everything in this world that has any importance to us comes to us through our minds. Our love of our families, our beliefs, all of our talents, knowledge, abilities, everything is reflected through our minds. Now, anything that comes to us in the future will almost certainly come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet, it's the last place on earth that the average person will turn to for help. Knowing these truths caused me to look for as much information as possible on the mind, which led me to Bob Proctor. Now, you may know Bob Proctor from the phenomenally uh, successful movie, The Secret. I think it's reached something like a half a billion people by now. Now, the information that Bob shared with me was taught to Bob some 50 years ago by a very important mentor of his, but was actually originated back in 1934 by a doctor from San Antonio, Texas. Now, his name was Dr. Thurman Fleet. Now, Dr. Fleet was highly aware that to be able to treat his patients' illnesses, he really needed to treat the entire person, starting with the mind. Now, he understood that his patients' physical ailments were a symptom to the problem, and that the real cause of the problem was in the mind. One of the greatest discoveries that Dr. Fleet made was that we actually think in pictures. Let's test that for a moment. Let me ask you to think of the front door to your home. And you'll notice that a picture came on the screen of your mind of the front door. Now, think of a friend or a family or perhaps someone you haven't seen in a while, and you'll find that a picture of that person came on the screen of your mind as well. Now, I could continue to suggest other things, people, places, and as I say the word, corresponding pictures will appear on the screen of your mind. Now, what if I were to say your mind? What image do you get? Now, this is generally when some people in my seminar start to look a little confused. You see, you may not have a picture at all, or if you're like most people, you probably receive a picture of your brain. But it's important to realize that your brain is a wonderful, magnificent switching station. It's a storage facility. But mind is actually an activity. In fact, it's found in every cell of your body. You see, mind is no more your brain than your elbow or your knee is. And since we didn't have a picture of the mind, well, Dr. Fleet created one, and here it is. And he referred to it as the stick person. Now, it may seem simple at first, but it's truly a phenomenal tool for understanding the mind and what causes the results in our lives. It'll also explain the law of attraction and why we don't necessarily receive what we hope for. So let's let the top circle represent the mind and the bottom portion represent the body. Now, the interesting thing here is is that the mind is much larger than the body. And, you know, he did that on purpose. Because we usually give all our conscious awareness, all of our attention to our physical body, and therefore our physical results, when really everything in our life is nothing but an expression of our mind, and our body merely carries out those actions. Now, our mind is made up of two distinct parts, one that gathers information, and we call that the conscious mind. The second is the part that controls our behavior, which of course produces our results, and we call this the subconscious mind. Your conscious mind is the part of you that thinks, reasons, your free will lies there. This is the part of you, your part of your mind, that will decide how much money you make, what relationships you have, how you look physically. The conscious mind has the ability to accept or reject any idea. You see, no person or circumstances in life can cause you to think about thoughts or ideas you don't choose. And the thoughts that you choose will eventually determine the results you're going to get in life. All pain, pleasure, or limitation is either originated in the conscious mind or accepted unconditionally from an outside source. As you accept the thought, it gets impressed upon the second part of your personality, which, as I mentioned, is your subconscious mind. Now, your subconscious mind is the part of you that certainly is the most magnificent. It's truly your power center, often referred to as the secret genie within. Every thought your conscious mind chooses to accept, this part of you, your subconscious mind, must accept. It has absolutely no ability to reject the information. This part of you operates in an orderly manner, which is referred to as law. To ignore the power of paradigms to influence your judgment is to put yourself at significant risk when exploring the future. To be able to shape your future, you have to be ready and able to change your paradigm. Now let's think for a moment. Why is it that one person is sad and yet another person is happy? Why is one person joyous, prosperous, another person poor and miserable? 
Why is one person fearful and anxious, yet another full of faith and confidence? Why does one person have a beautiful, luxurious home, while another person lives out a meager existence in a slum? Why is it that one person healed themselves of so-called incurable diseases, while another continues to struggle? Why is it so many good, kind, loving people suffer in their minds and bodies? Why is it that one person is happily married, yet another very unhappy and frustrated? So, is there an answer to these questions in the workings of your subconscious mind? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. It lies in the paradigm. Paradigms are a multitude of habits. Now, the problem is, they're other people's habits. Paradigms are like a program that has been installed in your brain. It's a program that would more likely be installed by people that are very close to you, people that love you very much. These are more likely good people who wanted nothing but the very best for you. The people who were writing your program were giving you what they had, what they believed to be true. More than likely, what they were given when they were growing up. Now, unfortunately, they had no idea what they were really doing. They very well could have been programming you with limiting beliefs that will control the remainder of your life. You see, very few people actually understand the mind. Many parents believe that their primary job was simply for your physical well-being. They had really little or perhaps no knowledge at all of what was actually happening to you mentally. They generally believe that if you're clean and warm and well-fed, well, their job was done. So as you are growing up in this world, you're being programmed by everything that they were thinking. Whatever they were doing and whatever they were saying, their world was becoming your world. Now cultures are founded on habits, work practices, attitudes, beliefs, and expectations, otherwise referred to as a cultural paradigm. So as you go through life armed with these paradigms, you will approach and react to the world around you interpreting what you see and experience according to your shared understandings of those culturally determined guidelines. A paradigm shows you that there is a game called life, what that game is and how you should play it successfully. A change in paradigm then is a change to a new game, a new set of rules. And when the rules change, the entire world will appear to be changing as well. All humans will act and feel and perform in accordance with what he or she imagines being true about themselves and their environment. William Shakespeare wrote, This above all, to thine own self, be true. You know, the fact is that many, many people are not true to themselves. For the image that most people have of themselves, good, bad, or even neutral, simply depends on past successes and failures. This idea of one's self-worth is so important, so much deeper and more meaningful than a mirror. You know, people carry this self-image into present activities and in their future plans. It's important to understand that if a person's self-image is nourished on past successes, well, it's going to be a pleasant one. But if inhibitions have blocked off the road to success and past failures clutter up the mind, well, that person's self-image is going to be poor. So let's, let's think about you for a moment. Let me ask you, what do you think of yourself? What do you really think of yourself deep down inside? Do you like yourself? Do you expect too much of yourself or do you sit back passively waiting for life to come to you? For people to do things for you? Do you set reasonable goals for yourself? Goals whose accomplishments will help you feel full and alive? Or do you let other people tell you what to do, what to think and how to behave? Do you think you're good looking? Are you secretly thinking that maybe your nose is too big or perhaps you need to lose some weight? What you think of yourself is very important. Remember, you can never outperform your self-image. To really live, to really live life to its fullest, you must have a realistic, adequate self-image, one that you can live with. You must like and trust yourself. You must feel that you can express yourself without the fear of exposure. You must feel no need to hide your true self. You must know yourself well. Your self-image must be realistic. It's who you really are. You feel good when your self-image is intact and adequate. You feel full of confidence. You're ready to show the world what you, what you are, who you are, and you're proud of it. Now, as you recall in previous lessons on paradigms, they were created genetically and environmentally. 
That environmental conditioning is programmed into your subconscious mind through the constant repetition of the information. To change the existing self-image, we must use the same method to build that new self-image. All great achievements were created twice, first in our mind and only then in the physical plane. When you run a movie through your mind of a future event you desire to take place, it creates an emotional impression on your subconscious mind. Do this enough, and eventually, the programs of your mind will move you towards that outcome, causing you to take the necessary steps to achieving that goal. One of the best things you can do every day is take a few moments and envision the good you want to manifest. The new thoughts about yourself. See yourself in a new light as an individual like no other on this earth. Forget your past failures. Bury them and think of your successes only, no matter how few there are. Remember, you have an obligation to yourself to make your life on this earth as happy as possible. Believe in this new truth and act on it. Resolve to be your own friend, not your enemy. Now, I'm not telling you that this is going to be easy, but if you keep at it, I can assure you that you can do this, and it'll be worth it. What the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Now, we become what we think about. And when we get excited about a goal, we're going to reach it. That's why it's been said, be choosy, therefore, what you set your heart upon. For if you want it strongly enough, you're going to get it. We can have anything we want. The trouble is that we don't know what we want. Sure, there's lots of little things. We want a new car, and maybe we get one. You want a new home, and perhaps you get that as well. You see, the system never fails to work. What we don't seem to understand is that it is a system. And if it'll work for you to get a new refrigerator or a car, it'll work just as well for anything else that you want. To truly understand the subject and the importance of goal setting, we have to realize that it is the very basis of success. It is, in fact, the very definition of success. Now, Earl Nightingale described success as the progressive realization of a worthy goal. I heard Bob Proctor refer to that as the absolute perfect definition of success. And you know what? I have to agree with him. It means that anyone who is on course towards the fulfillment of a goal is successful right now. Success is not the achievement of a goal, although most of the world would consider that to be success. Success lies in the journey towards the goal. You will find that happiness comes from the direction that we are constantly moving. Think about it for a moment. Children are happiest on Christmas morning before they open their presents than they are in Christmas afternoon. No matter how wonderful their gifts might have been, the anticipation is over. I'm sure they'll probably enjoy those gifts, but you'll often find that they're somewhat irritable on Christmas afternoon. You yourself might be happier on the way out for the evening rather than you are on the way home. We're also obviously happier preparing to leave on vacation than we are coming home. And believe it or not, we're happier moving towards our goal than we are after we've achieved our goal. That's why it's so important to set a new goal as soon as, well, as soon as the current one is realized. We should never stop this process. All the days of our lives we should be engaged in moving towards and looking forward to a new plateau to stand, a new goal to achieve. We are successful as long as we're working towards something we want to bring about in our lives. That is when we are at our best. That is what is meant to be by the quote, the road is better than the inn. Harold Melcher once said, live your life each day as you would climb a mountain. An occasional glance towards the summit keeps a goal in mind. But many beautiful scenes are to be observed from each new vantage point. Climb slowly, steadily, enjoying each passing moment, and the view from the summit will serve as a fitting climax for the journey. The proper goal will provide you with the necessary incentive to grow in awareness. Understand that you are a perfect expression of an infinite power. For you, all things are possible. As you become more consciously aware of your oneness with this infinite power within you, the awareness will be reflected in your results. Every aspect of your life is a mere reflection of your own level of awareness and thinking. James Allen wrote, Mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind, and evermore he takes. The tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. 
He thinks in secret, and it comes to pass. Environment is but your looking glass. Have you ever noticed that a person carrying a heavy weight, well, they're all right as long as they keep moving? The minute they stop and put the weight down to rest, that weight seems to become a lot heavier, and the distance to be traveled that much greater. And the work just that much more unpleasant. Have you ever noticed that the longer you look at something that you should be doing, the more difficult it seems to appear? That the longer you put off something that you should do, the more difficult it is to even get started? A good deal of frustration and unhappiness could be avoided if people would just do what they know they should do. Now, procrastination is a topic that I hear people tell me they suffer from on a regular basis. Now, what I've come to learn about procrastination is that procrastination is not the problem. In fact, it's not the problem at all. The problem lies in our ability to make decisions. You see, the opposite of procrastination is decision. Napoleon Hill once said, get in touch with your definite purpose so you may discern quickly when a great opportunity presents itself. Be decisive and take immediate action. Remember that sometimes the worst decision is making no decision at all. Don't allow self-doubt to stop you. Lee Jenkins. You know, Jim Ron wrote, motivation is what gets you started. Habit is what keeps you going. Now, in lesson two, we spoke a lot about paradigms. And paradigms are a multitude of habits. And in many cases, you're going to find that they're other people's habits. Now, when you woke up this morning, let's think about this. What did you do first? Did you hop in the shower? Maybe you checked your email or grabbed a muffin from the kitchen. Did you brush your teeth before or after all of this? What about your children? What did you say to them on the way out the door? And when you're heading to work, which route did you take? When you got there, did you check your email again? Did you chat with colleagues? Or did you jump right into writing a memo or something? Now, what about lunchtime? Did you have a salad or a hamburger? When you got home that night, did you go for a run or did you pour yourself a drink and eat dinner in front of the TV? Now, William James wrote, all our life, so far as it has definite form, is but a mass of habits. You know, most of the choices that we make each day may feel like they're products of a well-considered decision-making. But they're not. They're habits. Even though each habit means relatively little on its own, over time, the meals you order, what we say to our children at night, whether we save or we spend, or how often we exercise, and, of course, the way we organize our thoughts and work routines, have enormous impacts on our health, productivity, financial security, and, of course, happiness. It has been written that more than 40% of the actions people form each day were not actually decisions at all, but were habits. Countless people, from Aristotle to Oprah, have spent much of their lives trying to understand why habits exist. But only in the last few decades have we really begun understanding how habits work, and more importantly, how we can change them. You're going to hear people say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you know what? I don't believe that at all. You can change. But it's going to be a challenge because, first, you must undo the negative habit patterns that have been part of you for most of your life. Now, the purpose of this lesson is to help you cement your good habits and replace your poor habits with ones that will make your life happier and more successful. Habits can be good, even inspiring. The whole art of living is to overcome bad habits, rise above them, and create habits that make for a phenomenal life. I'm Lee Jenkins. You know, what you and I refer to as life is really an invisible power that flows to and through us. Our lives can be expressed in a very shallow, boring manner, or it can be vibrant and enthusiastic. The invisible power referred to as life operates in much the same manner as electricity does. You know, no one knows what electricity really is. We simply have a little knowledge of what it does. But there is a law in electricity, and it's called Ohm's Law. This law states that the amount of current that will flow in an electrical circuit will always be inversely proportional to the resistance in that circuit. The less resistance, the more current that's going to flow. The more resistance, the less current. Not only can you increase or decrease the flow of electricity, you can also use it for a destructive or constructive reason. This is also true with the power referred to as life. You are an instrument through which the life power flows. Resistance will limit the flow. 
We had many names for this resistance, and you probably know them all. Doubt, denial, fear, worry, which are going to dramatically limit the flow of life through you. Remove that resistance, and this power has the ability to make an entirely new person out of you. This life power responds to your beliefs, your mental attitudes, and your expectations. Now look around. You see very little life in some and others who have radiant and full lives. Remove that resistance and live. Now this lesson could be the path to a brand new life of possibilities. Now you've become familiar with Dr. Thurman Fleet stick person. You've learned how the mind functions on a conscious and a subconscious level. And as I mentioned, there's a power, a life force coming from the universe that flows to and through you. The resistance to the power can be found in the paradigm. The paradigm really controls your life. Anytime you go to make any kind of serious change in your life, anytime you decide to move outside your comfort zone, you'll experience that resistance, which I refer to as the resistance wall. With any change in your behavior, the resistance wall instantly creates a wall between you and what you desire. When this happens, you have a choice. As Abraham Maslow said, you will either step forward into growth or you're going to step back into safety. Most people, unfortunately, will step back into safety and experience the same results year after year. Or, the alternative is, you can be courageous and experience the growth you've been looking for. Fear and growth go hand in hand. When you courageously face the thing you fear, you automatically experience the growth you've been seeking. You can't allow your old conditioning to prevent you from taking action and enjoying the life that you desire. We all want good results from life, at home, at work, and our relationships with others. So it's important to understand the most important factor that guarantees good results day in and day out is a healthy attitude. So attitude is the magic word. Attitude is the composite of your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. Now our attitude will tell the world what we expect. If you have a happy, cheerful, expectant attitude, you're telling everyone you come in contact with that you expect the very best in your dealings. Most people never really actually think about their attitudes at all. You know, the reality is for most of them, it's a matter of beginning each day in neutral. Their attitudes are neither good nor bad. They're ready to react to whatever they may encounter. If what they come across is good, well, they're going to reflect that. And if it's bad, they're going to reflect that as well. They're constantly changing, going through the day, reacting to whatever confronts them. That's why it's very important for us to control our attitudes and make sure that our attitudes are excellent all the time. You know, William James wrote, human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. You know, Attitude is probably one of the most commonly used and yet most misunderstood words in the English language. You'll hear teachers tell their students that if they change their attitudes, well, their grades are going to improve. Or sales managers tell salespeople that their attitude controls their sales. Doctors will even tell patients, we've done all we can, now it's up to you. It's your attitude. When we have a good, clear understanding of what attitude is and how attitudes are formed, it will become very apparent that only a very small percentage of the population are actually in control of their attitudes. In truth, their attitude is being controlled by the media, by other people, by conditions and circumstances in their life. To properly understand attitude, you have to take another look at the relationship of the mind to the body and how the conscious and subconscious mind work and how they work in relationship with one another. 